On Sunday nights, we are in a study on the book of Revelation, and we have been going through the 20th chapter of Revelation. Uh, we've been talking about uh, Revelation from the standpoint of seven. Uh, you have sevens all through the book. I'm not going to go through that. Uh, but you do have seven seals, seven vials, seven trumpets, seven angels, seven spirits, seven thunders, and so forth, and it goes on and on. And of course, in the Hebrew language, Revelation is a Jewish book. Now, I've done about 36 to 38 messages on this book of Revelation, and for those of you that have been here, you know that it's a Jewish book. You've got the candlesticks, seven candlesticks. You've got the... Uh, you have the uh, throne of God, which was the Ark of the Covenant. You've got the altar of incense. You have all the things. You have the priesthood all through here. You have the glassy sea, which was the sea, the brazen sea, which sat right in front of the east door of the tabernacle. Being a Jewish book, you have to look at this from the number seven. The word uh, seven, the cardinal number seven is Sheba, S-H-E-B-A. Now, it's the same word in the Hebrew queen of Sheba, or queen of seven. And it comes from the word Shabbat. Shabbat means to take an oath. Sheba is the number seven. It's the cardinal number, or the number seven. And Shabbat, both of these come from the same root, the exact same root according to the theological word book of the Old Testament, and they mean the same. Shabbat means to seven oneself, or it means to take an oath, to take an oath, oath. And, of course, we see in 2 Peter, 2 Peter uh, 1 and verse 5, besides all this, give all diligence, add to your faith, and add to your faith, and he names 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 things. And it takes our entire lifetime. It starts with virtue, which is the word arete, A-R-E-T-E. -E. That word means manly or mature or to be grown up. It takes a long time to become mature. And from mature, we get the word martyr, martyr, one who dies to self. And we get the word martus from that. And martus is the word witness in the, uh, the Greek text. Well, we add seven things and we become sevened and it ends with charity or the word agape, agape. When we begin to walk in God's commandments, which is what agape is, that's when we are mature and you got these seven things. So we become sevened and we take an oath to God. It means to be complete, to complete oneself. So when we are sevened, all through the scriptures, we see the seven candlesticks, uh, we see the seven churches of Asia, which are the seven candlesticks in the first chapter, and the seven angels are the messengers, are the angels of the seven churches. Now, we're talking about chapter 20. I just kind of threw that in there. I have covered that extensively in some of our earlier tapes. Now, we're talking about the 20th chapter. I'm going to try to show you something I haven't shown you, and I'm going to show you... and. Uh, I'm going to show you why I believe what I believe on the thousand years. I believe that the thousand years, well, let's read it here. Uh, verse 1, chapter 20, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having a key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him, a thousand years. Now, there's some key words here. Bottomless pit, dragon, bottomless pit, pit, dragon. And this just shows you, if you will, define words, and then you have the word bound. You have bound and thousand. Now, bottomless pit, of course, we know what that word is. Let me give me another pen that writes better than that. That doesn't write good either. All right. Bottomless pit is the word A-B-U-S-S-O-S. -S -S. If, you, if you define these four words in these, in these verses right here, you'll find out 
that things don't mean what they appear to look like they mean in the English text. Bottomless pit is the word abusos in the Greek. It is a construction of the word bathos. Bathos means something with great intellectual depth, something that's a great profound, profound knowledge. And this is the word that's used over there in the second chapter of 1 Corinthians that speaks of the deep things of God, meaning God's great in-depth knowledge. When you place the alpha, first letter of the Greek alphabet, it's an A. Place it in front of a word as a negative particle. It negates the word, gives an opposite meaning. When you place the alpha or the alpha primitive, which is called as a negative particle, in front of bathos, it translates abusos, and it negates bathos and gives an opposite meaning to bathos. It means a place of no knowledge or no intellectual depth. That is the world. Satan is, is he is the dragon bound for a thousand years. Dragon, of course, is the word D-R-A-K-O-N. That word means to fascinate. Now, a lot of people are looking for the devil to come with fire and smoke, and they're looking for uh, world missiles going off, and they don't understand Satan does not come looking bad. He comes transforming himself into an angel of light. He comes making everybody feel good. It is not the devil that makes you feel bad when you're a Christian. It's God that makes you feel bad about your worthless soul and throwing yourself on his mercy and crying out, Lord, save or I perish. And God puts you through the fiery trials, not Satan. It's God that does that. Satan comes with good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple. That's how he came in the third chapter of Genesis. He was the serpent or the nakash. Nakash means to enchant. That's what he was. He was enchanting. He made Eve feel good. And bound is the word dio. Dio means to forbid or to declare unlawful. Lawful or, or guilty. And it's the exact opposite of the word luo, which means to loose, to loose. And that word loose, uh, luo, means to declare. It means to permit. The exact opposite of forbid, to declare lawful or innocent instead of guilty. And of course, this is the word loose, luo, and dio, that's the, that's binding and loosing. That's the law of the rabbis when they declared something lawful or unlawful or lawful. That's the law of rabbis in the Babylonian synagogue. And then, of course, the word thousand. I'm going to show you some things on this I haven't shown you. I believe thousand means the last 2,000 years. I've told you that it's plural. Now, I believe, here's a parsing guide. This is an analytical lexicon of, the, lexicon of the Greek New Testament. When most men look at the word thousand, most of your scholars will tell you in Revelation 20 that thousand means an indefinite period of time. They don't know quite what to do with it. Most, and people did not believe there was a thousand year reign up until the 1830s. This, according to Augustine, had a Jewish stamp on it. Now, we know that we're going to be changed at the last trump. Last trump. If we're changed at the last trump, last is the word eschatos. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52. Eschatos, that word comes from the word echo. Echo is the common Greek word meaning to hold something. When we think of an echo, we think of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, holding a sound. Hello, 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 hello. That's what we think of. Well, it means to hold, but the eschatos is the last in a series after which no other trumpet will sound, according to Thayer. It means the last in a series. So if we're going to be changed at the last trump, and the Bible says in Revelation 10 and 7 that when the seventh trumpet sounds, the mystery of God is finished. That's when our bodies are changed at the seventh trump. You've got seven trumpets in Revelation 8, 9, and 10. 
And the last one sounds, and Christ puts one foot on the land, another on the sea, and says, time is no more. Well, at the sounding of the last trump, according to Revelation 15, uh, 11 and 15, God conquers all of his enemies. Then Philippians 3.21, the same operation, the same operation that changes our bodies is going to conquer, is going to subdue all of God's enemies. We've already said that if there was a pre-trib rapture, this couldn't be. We'll read that in Philippians one more time. Look at Philippians 3 and 20 and 21. Speaking of Christ, speaking of Christ, Philippians 3, 20. Speaking of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body. That's the change. Uh, that it may be fashioned like his glorious body, according to the working, according to the E-N-E-R, E-N-E-R-G-E-I-A. We got our word energy. The word means operation. The same operation that changes our bodies, whereby he is able to subdue all things to himself. So he subdues all his enemies according to Philippians 3.21, by the same operation where he changes our bodies. The key to all of this is 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, God's going to destroy all his enemies by the same operation where he changes our bodies. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed in a moment. In the twink of an eye, at the last trump. Then he says in verse 26, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So God's going to destroy all his enemies at the last trump when he conquers his enemies at the same operation that changes our bodies. Now, according to the pre-trib raptures, you got people, you have a pre-trib rapture, and then you got people dying all the way through the tribulation. That can't be. Because death will be destroyed when our bodies are changed. Then you've got a, then you have this doctrine called premillennialism, and they say that there's a thousand year reign here, and therefore, and they say that you've got people who live who are in physical bodies, that the church has changed at the beginning of the tribulation. Then you got people living in physical bodies dying all through the thousand years. Well, how could we be changed at the same operation where he destroys all of his enemies? How could that be, especially if it's back here pre-trib, when you got people dying through the tribulation and you got people dying all the way through the millennium, the people without their glorified bodies. And then at the end of the millennium, or what they call the millennium, they say Satan is loose for a little season. Little season, and he rises up to conquer, to start attacking the church at the end of the thousand years. Wait a minute. We're going to be changed where God, at the same operation where God conquers all of his enemies, how can that be a pre-trib rapture and a thousand seven years later, or about a thousand years later, Satan rises up to be the enemy of God once more? Isn't that crazy? Now, thousand is plural. And let me give you something about this. I'm going to say something to you right now. I believe the thousand years means... Plural, when it says plural, I believe it's thousand is a unit of one. Is a unit of one. Now, the Greeks said that one was not a number, and they said that any multiple of ten, a hundred, or a thousand, some of the writers call that a secular perfect number, zeros multiplied by zero, that it's a form of of one. Let me read to you out of, let me read to you out of, I'm going to say this to you and I hope you can get it. Let me read out of, to, the, to you out of the words 
of mathematics, the etymological dictionary of mathematical terms used in English. I'm going to say something right now, and I'm going to show you in a moment. I do not believe the guys who wrote these parsing guides got everything in exact accord with the Greek language. I believe that when they looked at these numbers, numbers are one thing very few people know anything about, even the men who came up with these parsing guides are these analytical lexicons. They show in the analytical lexicon, I want to say this, I hope some of you will understand it. The, the Greek language is a dead language. At one time, it wasn't spoken, it wasn't written, and the men that have correlated and brought it alive, we've lost a lot of meanings. I believe that we've lost the meaning of numbers. Numbers. I do not believe when they translated these words in the 20th chapter of Revelation, I don't believe they went back to numbers. I, how many tapes have I done on gematria? Most people will tell you that gematria is superstition. When you see the 153 fish and seven people are fishing, and it adds up to 1,071, and that adds up to joint heirs, soon Clara and Amoy, and y'all that hadn't been here don't know what I'm talking about. But if you see that, that is not superstition. You can even look it up in McClinic and Strong, and they'll tell you it's an old ancient game that the Jews used. I don't agree with them there. I, I don't agree with everything they say. And I don't agree with everything that the parsing guides say, and I'll show you why in a minute. But let me read this to you. I believe that's where they messed up is on numbers. I've been believing that for a long time. I don't believe they went and studied numbers. Now, I believe this is what some of the parsing men did. I believe when they came up with this, I believe they took our number thousand and they presumed that was plural. Plural. Well, thousand is not plural because it's a multiple of ten hundred and a thousand and it's a form of one and one was not a number to the ancient Greeks. And Revelation is written in the Greek language. And thousand is a number out of the numerical world of the first century, the word kilia. Let me read this to you. Two is a noun. A native English word descended from the Indo-European duo, D-W-O, of the same meaning, although the W is no longer pronounced in the basic English word. It continues to be pronounced in quite a few related words, twain, twice, twenty, twelve, twilight. The interval between two times of day, twine, double thread, twill, double thread, Twig, a little bit that splits in two, betwixt and between. In Latin, the original Indo-European root developed into duo as well as by. Each form appears in many words that English has borrowed from Latin. Also from Latin is dubious, trying to decide between two choices and the related noun doubt. We have two thoughts, the inner man and the outer man. How's that? In Greek, the Indo-European root developed into duo and related forms from Greek English. From Greek, English has borrowed words from dyad or dodecagon, the ancient Greeks. Now, they should, somebody should have gone to what the ancient Greeks believed about numbers. The ancient Greeks believed two, two, they believe two to be the first number because the, they considered one a generator of numbers, but not a number itself. That's from an etymological dictionary of mathematical terms used in English. And they tell you uh, the integer two is the first and only even prime number. Now... That's what the ancient world in mathematics said about the number two and the number one. Well, let me give you something about number 10. 
a native English word for the Indo-European root decum or ten, D-E-K-M. English teen is a slight variant of ten that is used in the numerals from 13 through 19. Corresponding to the cardinal number 10 is the regular, regular ordinal tenth, as well as the variant tithe, a tenth of one's income donated to a church. Indo-European decum also had a variant decum ta, which later lost the initial D, the resulting form developed into hund, H-U-N-D, that appears in English hundred or ten tens, that same hund also appears in English thousand, a thick hundred. And hundred meant a fat ten. That's what it meant to them. I'm not going to go through all of them. The English names for ten to the first power, ten to the second power, and ten to the third power are therefore all etymologically related. In Latin Indo-European decum became decim, or we get our word December, and that was the tenth month of the ancient world. Appears in many borrowings from Latin such as decade and decimate. The variant decum ta became Latin centum or hundred, and it goes on and on. And if you go over into if you go over to thousand, it tells you it's a fat hundred. Or it is a that and what I'm trying to point out to you. I believe that they messed up here. And I'm going to show you something. In your lexicon, analytical lexicon, they come up and they tell you, for instance, I can't give you all of these, but let me give you one of them. They say that in 2 Peter 3 and 8, a day is with the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. They say in the analytical lexicon, that is A-I-A or A-I-C-H-I-L-O-I, I kill oi. And they say that means a thousand. But when you look it up in the interlinear Bible, it tells you that it is kilia. C-H-I-L-I-A, C-H-I-L-I-A, and they tell you that is plural. Plural. Now, A is a definite article. The, the, A, an. I'm going to show you how these guys messed up. Now, I believe what they've done. I believe what they've done is looked at our number 1,000 and they presume that it was plural. That's what I believe the parsing guides. You have to understand, everything we have on the Greek language, you cannot trace back to the first century. Some of it has been correlated by these scholars. There's no such thing as a, an expert in Greek in the world. No such thing. We are all students, including the best scholars there are. Or students. Now what they say here, they say you, when you have the, a, and an, a means singular. You can say the boys and girls. You can say the boys, but you can't say a boys and girls. A always denotes singular. When they tell you that this word I kill you is a thousand. And they tell you that's in Second Peter 3 and 8. And, but you look it up and it's kilia, kilia, and they say it's plural. There's a contradiction in your parsing guide when it comes to numbers. That's all I'm pointing out. There's a contradiction when it comes to numbers. Now, I'm looking. I'll tell you what I'm looking for. When they try to say that a thousand years is some indefinite period of time, I believe it is exactly. I believe where men have missed it is what they tell you in this etymological dictionary. One is not a number. One is a generator of numbers. I don't... A lot of the guys that make... I'm not going to... 
throw away my analytical lexicon because there's a difference in some of the scholars as what these, some of these things mean. When they put 8,000, that means singular. And you cannot, sometimes on the numbers, I believe that they're wrong, even in the parsing guide. Now, I can't go through all this. Some of them, it's plural. Some of it's singular. I believe if it's plural in the ancient world, the only thing that adds up is that the thousand years is not a thousand. It's 2,000 years. And that's from Christ until the end of time. Now, if you want to talk about this later, there are some contradictions here. And even back when the language was a dead language, I don't know how long it was dead, but it was resurrected by a lot of, quote, authorities. There's one thing that we know that it's dead to, it has not consistently, the Word of God has been alive in the Greek text, but there, there's been times during history that men were not studying the Greek language, and it is a dead language that they've resurrected. There were sounds to the, there were sounds back in, uh, uh, back in the first century and we know there were musical sounds to words that put a nuance on the word. Those musical sounds have long been lost if the language had not been a dead language and had been used all the way up to the present, we would know those musical sounds. I believe these guys, the parsing guys, now you're going to find a lot of guys will parse things. They'll get most of the words right. But when it comes to numbers, I believe they messed up. Because they'll tell you you've got a thousand, and they'll say this word kilioi is a thousand, and they'll say that's in Second Peter three and eight. And then when you look up Second Peter three and eight, it's kilios. All I'm and I'm I'm looking right now. I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. I am looking for some Greek authority. I called out to David Lipscomb College to a professor friend of mine out there. Now I'm not a Church of Christ, but this professor friend of mine. He started listening to our tapes about 10 or 12 years ago, and he did a flip-flop from free will over to predestination, and he's been called on the carpet several times out there. And I called him one time, and I said, I'm looking for someone who can tell me something about the construction of the Greek language, why this syllable was fitted with this syllable. And he said, I don't know anything about it. He said, you can call the head of the Greek department out here. So I called out there and called the head of the Greek department and I started in asking him. He had no idea where I could get a book on it. The head of the Greek department at David Lipscomb. He had, I said, I want something on morphemes, the shapes of words, so I can go find out how was this structured originally and who put this together. I believe they've messed up on the numbers is what I believe. And I'm still want to... And I, that's what I said to you one night. I have not ceased to study on the word thousand, which I believe is two thousand. I believe it is plural, and it's the only thing that fits. If you study, if you go study 50 people on the thousand years, and I'm talking about scholars, as of 200 years ago, most of them are going to tell you, most of them are going to tell you that this is, that thousand is an indefinite period of time because they came, they could not, they all knew there wasn't a thousand years. That had a Jewish stamp, like Augustine said. They wanted their own kingdom, but that doesn't work because you got Satan rising up at the end of time. And how could that be? And you got people dying. You got all these enemies of death and Satan rising up here when he, God's going to conquer all of his enemies by the same operation where he subdues all his things to himself, he's going to change our bodies by that same operation. So this don't work. So the people that the thousand years after it's all over didn't work, they just say it's an indefinite period of time. I do not believe that. I believe it's the last 2,000 years from Christ to the end. Now, that's one of the things I'm wrestling with. I never have mentioned that before. <laughs> And that's one of the things I am hunting for. Someone who knows the structure, but I bet there's not a Greek professor in the country. I want to find somebody that knows something about how the words were structured in the Greek language, particularly numbers, because when you get into gematria, people say, oh, that's just a superstition. Well, that's just some old Jewish 
puzzle that kids use to entertain themselves. That's not true. And everything you get on most people, they'll say thousand years was some indefinite period of time. And they don't know what it is. I believe what we've taught on it is the truth on it. That's what I believe. Now, I'm still, I'm still studying it. Can you see why I'm studying it? Because I don't believe the parsing guides are correct fully on it. Because they'll say 8,000 and they'll come up and call it all plural. And uh, when you have 8,000, that's 1,000, not two. But I believe when you have plural thousand, you've got 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Not thousand in the sense that it's more than one. Because thousand is a form of one. And you always say a thousand, don't you? You'll say a thousand. That's because it's one. It's one thousand. And you got two thousand. You got three thousand. Well, when you get to two, that's when they started counting plural. So I believe the last 2,000 years, I haven't said that to you all before, and this has been in my mind, and everything I tell you, I don't tell you things I'm wrestling with. For those of y'all that have been here, you can understand what I'm talking about, can't you? I believe that the, I don't believe all the parsing guides, they seem to contradict themselves in some places when you get real definitive with them. Now, we're talking about Here's what we're talking about. Let me get back to it. Did y'all understand some of the things I was talking about? Huh? When it says 8,000, that's singular. All right. Now, here's what we're talking about. I'm, I'm really amazed. I have never read after anyone who has gone and found out anything about numbers and mathematics in the first century ancient Greek. Never heard anybody even discuss it remotely, ever. And we've studied numbers here, and some of it's just hair-raising is what it is. Now, here's what we believe, and I'm not going to go into it. We believe that from Jesus to the end of time is... Two days, or one day, since the day of the Lord is a thousand years, and that that's the 2,000 years, that's the 2,000 years. Now, we know in Acts 2, in Acts 2, we know this was somewhere, we're not really sure, all of the, when you start studying chronology, and you start studying the timeline no one knows what year we're living in. None of, the ancient, none of the ancient calendars are reliable, none of them. They had several that they lived by. We've got a couple, the Julian calendar, the Gregorian calendar. They lived under the old ancient Persian calendar. The Jews had a 360-day year calendar that they lived under, and that's the one that I believe we're under. Now, the Bible teaches, I believe that the last days are the last 2,000 years. And, of course, Peter stood. Now, somewhere around 29 to 35 A.D. is when Jesus died. We're not really sure. We're living... This is why the Bible says, The day of the Lord will so come as a thief in the night. But you're not the children of the darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. No man knows the day nor the hour, but nobody knows the exact time. But when you see these things begin to come to pass, lift up your head and look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. We will know the season. So what we'll know. Now, somewhere about 35 A.D., maybe, maybe a few years later, maybe a few years earlier, so we believe the last days are the last 2,000 years. And what we believe, that is what has been translated as millennium, which mil means thousand, anna means years. We believe that Satan's little season when he rises up is at the end of the thousands years or here at the end of time. We're going to be changed at the last trump 
And this is where God conquers all his enemies. Conquers all enemies at the same operation where he subdues all things to himself. There is a little season of Satan, little season at the end of the 2,000 years, not at the end of 1,000 years. Satan can't rise up as the enemy of God, enemy of God, because our change is going to destroy all of his enemies. That's what the Bible says. Now, we're, we're talking about this little season right there. Now, I don't know when this little season of Satan begins. Let's look back at the two verses in this chapter that point towards the little season of Satan in Revelation 20. Revelation 20, verse 3. And that the angel cast him into the bottomless pit and shut, up, shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. It doesn't say that he will deceive the Jews no more. Nations is the word ethnos. We get our word ethnic from that. And it means non-Jews. There's a 2,000 year period. A 2,000 year period where that. There, a certain group of Gentiles. Cannot be deceived. How about the Gentile church? The elect of God. The predestinated elect Gentile church. Satan is going to be forbidden. Dio. Forbidden from deceiving the Gentile church for a 2,000 year period. I believe that's what that's talking about. Then at the end of that 2,000 years, he's going to come out and deceive. Now how does Satan deceive? Come out dressed in a red suit and then breathing fire and he's got red horns and he's got a dragon over here going and breathing fire and going, hey, I'm evil. I'm going to deceive you. Is that stupid? Satan deceives with good words and fair speeches, smooth doctrine from the pulpits of the churches in America that don't preach predestination, that don't preach Christ mass as pagan, that don't preach a daily cross and death to self and self-denial and suffering for righteousness sake. He comes on preaching another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. Paul said that I haven't preached. He comes on looking and sounding like Jesus in the big Baptist churches and the Pentecostal charismatic churches. The Methodist churches and the church of Christ. He comes on looking like a nice Jesus. But that's the other Jesus. That's how he deceives. Boy, that's going on today, isn't it? We're in it. I believe we're in the season of Satan. Everybody's got this twisted. They're looking for the devil in a dragon, a fire-breathing dragon, where St. George goes out and slays him with a sword, and the dragon's got a big goofy-looking head, and he's got wings like a bat, and they're going, Wah! that's not the dragon. The dragon fascinates and makes people feel good. Yeah. Like all these smooth-talking preachers, and they don't use great plainness of speech. That's the deception. That's the little season of Satan. Now, Look down here in verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished, or the two thousand years. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him... I believe it should be 2,000 years. Now, what is the second death? You find that up in verse 14. Verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And look at verse, uh, look at chapter 21 and verse 8. And the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, most scholars believe that the word death, of course, the word Greek word death is T-H-A-N-A, 
T-O-S, or T-H-A-N-O-S. The word, I believe the word means separation, along with most scholars. Separation, it does not mean annihilation. That's where the Jehovah's Witnesses get their doctrine. They say, death, see, you're destroyed and you're in destruction. Well, death meaning separation. The rich man died and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm tormented. And he said, no, son, remember, in your life you had good things, Lazarus, evil things. Now he's comforted, you're tormented. Besides, there's a great gulf, C-H-A-S-M-A, chasma. We get the word chasm. It means separation. There's a great separation. I believe that great gulf is death. It's an everlasting, you wouldn't call it existence. You couldn't call it existence because existence, somebody asked me the other day, who was it? Oh, was it you? Do they have everlasting life in hell? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a valid question. What do you call it when somebody is, has consciousness for eternity? You call it life? No, because life means to be with Christ. Death means to be separated from Christ. And the man in hell is separated from God for his own sins. That's why the, when people say Jesus died for everybody in the world. No, he didn't. The Bible says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. He died for his wife. He didn't die for the man in hell. The man in hell is being separated for his own sins. Where was I? I was going to give you something here. Huh? Death is... Death is separate. Oh, that's the second death. Yes. That's the second death. Which is, well, I brought that out last week. That, that's all the people that die from Christ until the end of time, and they don't live. The ones who died back in, in 2000, uh, 205 A.D., and the ones who died in in 1654 A.D., and the ones who died in, in 1895 A.D., and the ones who died in 1943 A.D., all these are the rest of the dead during that time period, do not live until the 2,000 years is over at the end of time. You see that? Now, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, verse 6. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him 2,000 years, as I believe what that should say. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Now that goes with... Verse 3, the last phrase, he must be loosed a little season. Isn't that amazing? The word loosed is the word luo. He has been bound. Whatever you bind on earth, be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, be loosed in heaven. That's, huh? That's right. It's lawful for him to be loosed and to go out and deceive, to deceive the Gentile church. Is the Gentile church deceived today? They preach false doctrines. They preach accept Christ, which is not true. They don't talk about repentance. They don't talk about a daily cross. They don't talk about death to self. If you notice, well, look here. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 24. Here's what he says. Matthew 24, they said, Lord, when will be the end of time? When will these things be in what will be the sign of thy coming into the end of the world? In verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, because at the end of time, when the little season of Satan is here, many shall come in my name, saying that I am Christ. That does not say that they're going to say they're Christ. They're going to say, Jesus said, many will come, saying, they're even going to tell you that I'm Christ, and they'll deceive because they won't tell you the truth about the Word of God. You can't deceive anyone saying you're Christ. And people say, Sun Yun Moon, he is the Antichrist. No, he's not. He's just one of many. 
you can't deceive anybody saying, I'm a little bald-headed Korean. I, I'm Christ. Duh. Now, who does that deceive? When the Bible says they will deceive the very elect if it were possible, well, is it even possible? Does, when Lord Maitreya, is he, is he going to rise up and deceive the world, saying, I am Christ? No. The man who deceived will actually say that Jesus is Christ, and they won't tell the truth, and they'll deceive many. That's what he's talking about. And that's, the little, that's what's going to be going on in the little season at the end of the 2,000 years. And let's see what else is going to be going on at the end of the 2,000 years. Let's continue to read. And shall go out to deceive the ethnos, the ethnics. Now, he's been forbidden for a 2,000-year period from deceiving the Gentiles, the non-Jews. But we're going to be spiritual Jews, aren't we? That's what we are. Let me give me a drink here. Now, <clears throat> here we go. <laughs> oh, me. It's a long, long ride here. Just stay with me. I won't get through this all tonight. Verse 8. He shall go out, go out to deceive... The Gentiles, even the Gentile church, if it were possible, and he's going to look so good, and he's going to sound so much like Jesus, he's going to be deceptive. Fire and brimstone, fire coming from the mouth of a little dragon, explosions going off, and some men coming on the scene saying, I'm the Antichrist, I'd like to introduce myself. That's not going to deceive anybody. Hal Lindsay and these guys and Jack Van Ampey, they are really messed up which are in the four quarters of the earth. In the four quarters of the earth, back in that day and time, all they had, all the only maps that they had showed from Spain or Espana over to what we call Pakistan over in here. And that was uh, the Far East in the ancient world. They had an earth that was four-sided. That's Nobody believed the earth was round. If they went back in the Old Testament scriptures, I believe it's in Isaiah where, where he says, it is he that sitteth on the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof as grasshoppers. And he spreadeth out uh, the heavens as a tent to dwell therein. If they had looked at the circle of the earth in the Old Testament, they would have known it wasn't flat. But the writers here are using the terminology of the people at that day and time so they had four quarters. You remember the four angels in Revelation, the seventh chapter, that come? And they come from the four winds. They said they had four winds. A north wind, a west wind, an east wind, and a south wind. This was the four corners of the earth to them. So you have to look at what they were saying. You're not going to understand four corners if you draw a, a, a globe and say, oh, what do they mean four corners? That's what they meant. And that's all the civilization they had. Now, Gog and Magog. We've said, in, we've said continually, in the Old Testament, you've got the shadow. The shadow. In the New Testament, you have the very image. Very image are the spiritual according to Hebrews 10 and 1. The spiritual, the real thing. And of course, the image, when you're out in the sun and the light shines on you, that casts the shadow. The shadow is cast back this way. But where did the shadow, where did the shadow originate? In eternity. So the shadow, the spiritual, which was in the mind of God from forever, cast the shadow here. Right? It was in God's mind, and God wrote down the shadow. When you see a shadow on the ground, there's an image casting the shadow. Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number is who, of whom is the sand of the sea. Now, what we're going to have to do, let me get my maps out here that I've been meaning to use. All right. I've got to get these out. I might need them. 
Gog and Magog. What is he talking about, Gog and Magog? Gog and Magog were the old ancient enemies of God. That's what they were. We're going to have to go back. Let's go back and look at the shadow in the Old Testament, okay? Let's go back to the shadow. We're going to have to go back to the 38th chapter of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 38. Now, I'm going to have to, in order to teach you this correctly, the 38th chapter of Ezekiel follows in sequence with the 36th and the 37th chapter of Ezekiel. I'm just going to read a couple of verses out of the 38th chapter, but I'm going to have to back up. 38. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Everything in the Old Testament will give you the shadow of what's going to go on. Let me just say this. Gog and Magog was a literal system in the Old Testament. It is a spiritual system over here. Israel was a literal system over here. Israel over here is you and I. A Jew is not outwardly of the heart. Circumcision is of, of the heart. Well, what about this Israel over there in the land of Israel, in this land on the eastern end of the Mediterranean? What about them? Unless they come through Jesus Christ, no man comes to the Father but by me, they will not be spiritual Israel. They will die in their sin and go to hell. Now, God very well may be convicting the hearts for a remnant of these people. The main thing that literal Israel is for is a time clock for the end of time. Don't ha I don't doubt that. That he's what? Now, what verse are you looking at? I'm looking at 28. Well, he shall go out to deceive the nations. Well, they're not going to be deceived by the smooth talk. The Jews have to be looking at binding and loosing when the Pentecostals stand up and talk about binding and loosing. And they say, we're going to bind the devil in a beer joint. Loose Jesus on a massage party. Yes, amen, praise God. That's stupid. <laughs> Binding and loosing was a rabbi's term that they came up with in the Babylonian synagogue when a new rabbi came in. He was handed the book of the law and told to bind and loose according to the book. Declare lawful or unlawful. Get rid of your opinions. Now, what was that question? <laughs> I very well, I do not believe that the Jews are fooled by any of this. They're not fooled by this. By Pentecostal binding and loosing, are they? If they're not fooled by that, they're not fooled by any of the doctrines. And people say, but if they come to Christ, they don't like the church in America. Well, the church in America is not the church. So if they come to the knowledge of Christ, it'll be through the truth. It won't be through this big lie in America. Will it? And, of course, we are this true Jew. As many as walk according to this rule of a new creation, peace be on them on the Israel of God. We're God's Israel. The, they're not all Israel which are of Israel, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So they're going to have to join us in the church. Now, even Alvin McLean in 1940, he could not see the Jews becoming a nation again in 1948. He couldn't see it, and he wrote his book, The Seventy Weeks of Daniel, unable to see that, thinking the Jews were going to be only spiritual and never again ever come back into a nation. Because at the time he wrote his book, Adolf Hitler was, was purging the Jews and killing them and putting them in all of these camps in Europe, in Germany. He couldn't see it. What is it that we can't see about the literal Israel? They're going to have to come through Christ. And if they believe, people say, but the Jews don't like, like Christianity. No, they don't like Catholicism and Baptists. That's not Christianity. Yeah, they were looking. And guess what? They're still looking for the Messiah. Let's just say that they wake up one day and realize 53rd chapter of Isaiah and the 22nd chapter of Psalms which prophesies Christ as the Messiah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And they are. And they are. But the, the key is this. When they hate the church in America and they hurt Christian America, that's not Christianity. So they're not, that's not what they're going to believe. They're not going to come to the Baptist doctrine. They're not going to come to Pat Robertson or Jay Falwell. They'll have to come to the doctrine of predestination. They'll have to come to death to self and a daily cross. And they can come to that easier than they can come to an American religion. Huh? That's right. I hope it's me. Now, I don't know how this is going to work at the end of time, and nobody knows. I'm not going to write to Hal Lindsey or Jack Manning and ask them. <laughs> of all things, I'm not going to do it. Now, let me just show you about Gog and Magog. <laughs> Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog. The chief prince of Meshech and Tubal... And prophesy against him. Let me, let me give you who Gog and Magog is, okay? All right. Gog and Magog. Let me read this to you. This is an article I wrote researching out of some areas of the McClinican Strong. Let me read to you. Gog is derived from the title of ancient pagan heathen kings called Agag. You remember the king that, that Saul in the 15th chapter of 1 Samuel, he went to the Amalekites. The Amalekites were down south of Israel in the Negev desert down here. And he went to Amalek and he brought back a king up here named Agag, didn't he? And Samuel had to kill him because Saul kept him alive. Samuel took a a sword and hacked him to the ground in his rage. Agag means flame. How about the fire worship of the sun in Numbers 24 and 7? Let's look at that. Numbers 24. Numbers 24. 7. <clears throat> He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. And in 1 Samuel 15, look at 1 Samuel 15. This is where Samuel does not do, does not execute the fist wrath of God against Amalek. 1 Samuel 15. And Saul goes down to Amalek and brings back a lot of the sheep, brings back a lot of the, uh, lot of the other animals. And then Saul makes an excuse to God, <coughs> uh, to Samuel. Uh, Saul makes an excuse to Samuel, say, I couldn't help it. The people made me do it, kind of like the devil made me do it, like Flip, Flip Wilson used to say. And look at verse 8. Saul, well, 7. Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah, until thou comest to Shur, that is, over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But he brought Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen, the fatlings and the lambs, and all that was good. He brought that back to the land of Israel from the, from the Negev desert and brought them back and kept them alive. And Samuel said, this is rebellion. It's just the sin of witchcraft. And he, of course, he took a sword and slaughtered Agag. Now let me continue reading. As to, the, as to the signification of Gog, it appears to mean mountain. Or the Caucasus mountains. It's the Persian. Let me write this down for you. It is the Persian. This word Gog. Let me erase this. Now, you see, in order to study Revelation, we're going to have to go back to the Old Testament, and we're going to have to actually study what Gog actually was. There's a spiritual Gog and Magog, and there is a literal Gog and Magog, and that's the Old Testament. The whole thing you have to look at is the character of Gog and Magog and what it's going to do. Now, the word 
Gog comes from caucus. C-A-U-C-A. C-A-U-C-A. Uh, S-U-S. Caucasus. Now the Caucasus Mountains. This is, you see the, those mountains right there? That's looks like a hill. It's got the darkened area here. That's the Caucasus Mountains. You notice this is an old map, USSR. That's Armenia or Georgia in Russia. This is the northern, this is northern Mesopotamia. Here's Mesopotamia. Here's the Mesopotamian Valley. The very seat of all civilization was the Sumerian, S-U-M. E-R-I-A-N, not Samaria, Sumerian society, which was on, in southern Mesopotamia. This is where Babylon was. This is where the Garden of Eden was. This is, uh, this is the very essence of everything that uh, every, everything he was built upon. That was the Babylonian, the head of the Babylonian world. Northern Mesopotamia was the area of the Caucasians or the Assyrians. Assyrians, or some called them Scythians. The Scythians were barbaric hordesmen, just like the Huns, just like the Mongols. They could ride a horse and shoot arrows, and the riders say that they could turn sideways and hit a target dead center. They were like the American Indians, except maybe even they rode constantly, slaughtered and pillaged. These were the most evil people that they can find upon the face of the earth. They said that the Assyrians were scientists of butchery. They invented barbarianism. They are the ones. It was the Assyrian Caucasians. up Here's what's really amazing to me. The Caucasian people act like they're better than everybody else. They're the most barbaric people who ever lived. At one time, it was said that one of the Assyrian, one of the, now we're, when we're talking about Gog and Magog, we're talking about Assyrians or Caucasians is what we're talking about. Now, n not in the New Testament, it's going to be everyone who's evil that's going to attack the church. But in the ancient world, it was the Caucasus, and right up here in the Caucasus, it was the Assyrians or the Caucasians who took northern Israel into captivity in 722 B.C. The Assyrians or the Scythians invented scalping. They're the ones who came up with and created burying a man up to his neck in the sand. And now people think this is the American Indian, but it wasn't. It was Caucasians. And they would pour honey on his head and then turn fire ants loose on him. They, they created that. Not the American Indian. In fact, most of this was brought to the American Indian through the Spaniards that came and tried to conquer people like, uh, uh, like Cortez. And, and who's the guy that came down through? Uh, the, the guys who came up through... Well, I guess it was DeSoto. Most of those Spaniards, they were the guys who brought this slaughter and butchering and taught it to the American Indians. They created and invented strapping a man down in a desert, spread eagle like this on his back, and putting a wet piece of rawhide over his throat, tightening it up, and as it dried, it was strangling. The American Indian didn't invent that. The Caucasians did. That's what amazes to me. The Caucasians think they are better than the rest yeah. in all of the societies of the world, don't they? Yeah, right. Well, that was the land of Gog. They called their mountains Magog, and they called their leaders, and they named the highest points after their leaders and called that Gog. And this was the old ancient enemies. Of God is who they were. And they're the ones that came down and attacked Israel, weren't they? Huh? Well, you can see that in this 38th chapter. Let me read the rest of this. As to the signification of Gog, it appears to mean mountain. It comes from Caucasus. Caucasus is the Persian, or the Persian, Ko, K-O-H. 
and the ascetic Gog. G-H, the word Caucasus. The Caucasus Mountains between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. This was the very seat of the Caucasian civilization. When Japheth, the eldest of Noah, settled, he set up, settled up here in the Caucasus area. Japheth was the father of the Caucasians. That was the ancient Assyrians. Now, we don't care about race here. Because there's only two races with God, Jew and Gentile. Those of us who are Caucasians and those of us who are black here in this congregation were all Jews of the heart. If, if we Caucasians lived according to our ancestors, we'd get us a horse and go out here pillaging and shooting and raping and, and burning. That's what they did in the ancient world. They were the worst of the worst. Now, let me finish this. It comes from Gog, Ko, and Gog meaning mountain. G-H-O-G-H, Ko, Gog, and we get the word Gog from Gog, and that's the word Caucasus, and that's the seat of the Assyrian or the Scythian civilization. Or it means mountain. Even the classical name Caucasus originated Kaukaf, K-O-H-K-A-F, K-O-H. K-A-F. You say, Jim, what is this all about? We have to study this to see what they did to Israel and what, it, what the Bible talks about, a future attack upon Israel to understand that Gog and Magog is going to attack the church worldwide. Since Caucasus was the chief seat of the Scythian or the Assyrian people, these people settled in the Caucasus Mountains directly north of Israel. Here's Israel. Here is the Caucasus Mountains up here in the north. When the Assyrians carried away northern Israel into captivity in 722, they carried them up here into this area. That's why so many Jews are coming. And Russia is right here. And you go straight up, straight up through here and you go straight to Moscow. That's why there's so many Jews coming back from Russia because they're the ones that carried into captivity by the Assyrians. The ten northern tribes were carried away captive. Now, let me finish this here. These people settled in the Caucasus Mountains. The word Gog comes from Caucasus or Caucasian. The Caucasus Mountains directly north of Israel in, the upper, Mesopot in upper Mesopotamia and further north between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, which is currently called Armenia or Georgia, a state of the now defunct Soviet Union. The hardening of the last sound H into a G, Gog, from Ko, K-O-H, seems to have taken place early. And when the name had already become that of a people, the other names, Magog and Agag, rose. Another explanation comes from the pelvic Koka, K-O-K-A, meaning moon. Land of the moon worshipers. Because they prayed to the Lord Moon. Who is the Lord Moon? When you see the crescent moon, that is, that represents, it doesn't matter if it's on the fezes of the, of the Shriners, or if you find it on the temples there in, and we get the word croissant from that. Crescent. And that's why they are moon-shaped. And it was said that, that Nimrod killed a great bull and put the horns on his head. And when you find that, that's supposed to depict the horns of the bull. And Nimrod started the sun worship. So this means land of the moon. According to Renege, some of the Caucasian people called their mountains Gog. And the highest points they call Magog. Excuse me, I had it backwards. 
They call their mountains Gog, and they call the highest points Magog, and they name their leaders after their mountains. Huh? I'm reading from McClinic and Strong. Huh? Mm -hmm. Magog means region of Gog, the second son of Japheth. All right, now, what does the Bible say? Where is that? The 40, is that the 49th chapter of, let me, let me go over here and look. I believe it's the 49th chapter of Psalms, I think. Hold on. Yeah, 49th chapter of Psalms, look over there with me. Verse 10 and 11. For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish, or the stupid man, stupid person perish, and leave their wealth to others. They're, he's talking about evil men who are powerful men. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever, and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Isn't everything named after Columbus, Ohio, Columbus, Georgia, Washington, D.C., America, America's Vespucia, Amerigos, yeah, Vespucia. All of this, they call their lands by their own names. Well, right here I've got a, uh, this is called the Table of Nations right here. This is a map I drew years ago. Here's the Table of Nations. The Table of Nations is found the table of nations is found in the 10th chapter of Genesis. Let's go back over to the 10th chapter of Genesis. Here is the table right here. Now, let's go over to Genesis 10 in order to see who Gog actually is and Magog, okay? Uh, Genesis 10. Genesis 10. This is the chapter where all the nations after the flood where the sons of Noah and their sons went to. Chapter 10, let's look at this. Verse 1, These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Unto them were sons born after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, All right, here is, I've got Magog up here. Magog actually extends up here to the, between the Caspian and the Black Sea. Here's Magog up in here. Gomer is up in here. That's Russia. That's, uh, Gomer is right about where the, uh, where the Russian premiers go and they vacation down here on the Black Sea. That's a, a vacationing area for the Russian rulers. Here's Magog right up in here. That's in Magog. I should have moved it up there a little bit higher on the chart to have it right in the middle of the Caucasus Mountains. All right, let's continue reading. Oops, I looked at the wrong one. Okay. The sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog, Medai and Javan. Look here. All right. I hadn't looked. There's Medai. And... Uh, Javan here. These are where his different sons settled. This is just the name of a man that they call after their names. Okay, let's read. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Rephath, and Togarma. Now I'm pointing out Gomer and Togarma for a reason. Okay, there's Togarma right in there. Well, where did that? Okay. Okay, in verse 2, And Tubal and Meshach and Tiras. Now, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Meshach and Tubal on these charts. Here's, now I have to go real slow. Here's a chart of all, here's a chart 
of all of the beast of the ancient world. The beast was Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And Assyria was coupled with Babylon. Uh, they were interchangeable, Babylon and Assyria. Meshach and Tubal, between the two, between Tubal and Meshach, they were in every system of these empires. Between the two, they were in every one of the empires, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. What is the chief prince? Chief is the word rosh. It doesn't mean Russian. It means head. What is the head prince of the empires? What's the head prince? Satan, the prince of the power of the air. So the head prince of Meshach and Tubal would be Satan the prince of the power of the air. Let me set this down and keep my, my table of nations. Now, the reason I'm showing you this, I'm, sh I'm, I'm showing you how these men, they named their, their lands. Now, I've got, this, I've got this map in one book. I've never seen it in another book. I've got it in one. But it is the table of nations. This is called the table of nations. All right, let's continue reading. And the sons of Javan, there's Javan there over in the Grecian islands. The sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after their tongue, after their families, in their nations. And the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, here's Cush, Mizraim. The Negroid race comes from there. Cush, Mizraim, these were, this was the descendants of Ham. You have the, the descendants of Japheth, the Caucasians, and here's the black man here. Cush, Mizraim, right here. Right there in, just below the, the, Mediterranean Sea, there in the Egyptian area, right there about where the uh, Nile River is. This is where Moses delivered the children of Israel, went across the Red Sea and came down here. There in that little point right there, that's the Sinai Peninsula. Here's the Red Sea here. Here is Israel right in here, Persian Gulf. Over here is is the Euphrates River. I got that thing nearly going to north. I didn't, I'm not the best at drawing maps. All right, now let's, let's continue. Where was I? And the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim and Foot, all down here in the Egypt area, and Canaan. And the sons of Cush, Sheba, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Reama, and Sabtaka, and the sons of Reama, Sheba and Dedan. And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty hunter in the earth. He was a mighty hunter. The word actually means opposing the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, or Babylon, and Erech, we get the word Iraq, and word Erech, from Erech we get the word y e r. Y-E-A-R-E-C-H. That is one of the words in the Old Testament for moon. Now, remember, Allah was worshipped as the Lord Moon. Why the moon? Because another name for Allah was M-E-N-I-Y, and that means the number in the moon according to the first chapter of Genesis, numbered the seasons. The moon was the numberer, and Allah was called the numberer. So this is the land of the moon worshipers. It's what it is. Wait a minute, I think, aren't all these people all in this area Muslims, and they're moon worshipers, and they worship the Lord Moon? And in the ancient world, before Muhammad came along around uh, 576 A.D., 
Allah was worshipped as the Lord Moon, and Israel was indicted for worshipping, pouring out drink offerings to that number, Mene, they were worshipping Allah. And all of this is where God came, comes from. Let me show you. Magog means region of Gog, the second son of Japheth in Genesis 10 and 2, in 1 Chronicles 1 and 5. Noble says that Magog comes from the Sanskrit Ma, that's M-A-H, M-A-H, that it comes from Ma, or Maha, meaning great, and a Persian word signifying mountain, great mountain. Babylon was a destroying mountain, God said she's a proud mountain. A mountain was a capital city of an empire. And God said, I'll make you a burnt mountain. And we see Babylon burning in the 18th chapter of Revelation. In which case, the reference would be to the Caucasian range between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. The terms Gog, G-H-O-G-H, the terms Gog, and Moghef, M-O-G-H-E-F, M-O-G-H-E-F, F. All of these are derivatives of these names. H-E-F are still applied to the same, to some of the heights of the Caucasian range or the Caucasus range. Hidzig connects the first syllable with the Coptic ma. This is, these are Hitzig, H-I-T-Z-I-G. He is a historian. Z-I-G. Hitzig, let me give you this again. Connects the first syllable, Coptic ma, meaning place. Ma means place. Place, or the Sanskrit maha, land, and the second with the Persian root, koka, K-O-K-A, koka, uh, let me see, ma place, maha land, and the second, the Persian root, koka, and let me recall, kokaf, the origin of the Caucasus or Caucasians, meanings, Koka means the moon. It means the land of the moon. That's what it means. What are the moon worshippers? Babylonians? Let me give you this. Hold your place and go to Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Huh? Hold your place there. In Ge well, I may come back to Genesis. Let's go back to Ephesians. The See, you have to understand Gog and where it comes from in Magog in order to understand the spiritual Gog and Magog in order to see what they did in the 38th chapter of, of Ezekiel. Look over here in Ephesians. Now, this is the spiritual in Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Verse, verse, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Then he tells you what we're fighting against. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This is not human beings we're wrestling against. And it's not some spiritual entity. It's evil men is what it is. But we're wrestling against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Genesis, the first chapter, what ruled the darkness? The Lord Moon. 
where did they worship the Lord Moon? The Assyrians worshiped the Lord Moon, the Caucasians, Gog and Magog, and they worshiped the moon, the man of the moon, among all of these people, all of these ancient Arabs, and they worshiped the Lord Moon. And the moon was said to be androgynous. It was male and female. When it was male, it was identified with Venus and all the female deities. When it was male, it was Allah or Alon, the oak tree, or the Lord Moon. Now these were, who were all these people, the Babylonians and the Assyrians? They were the enemies of Israel. They're the ones that carried Israel into captivity, didn't they? Huh? Huh? I'm trying to go through this slow. When you see what the literal Gog was, you'll understand the spiritual Gog. Babylon was the mother of all idolatry in Revelation 17 and 5. And all idolatry, sun and moon worship, started in Babel. Babel, that's where the sun and moon worship started. And their doctrine was what? Let us make us a name. Let us make us a name. The word name is Shem. They didn't say let us make us a Japheth. Shem was the second born of Noah. And when Noah came out of the ark, he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. They said, let us make up our own doctrine. All sun worship and moon worship of the Assyrians and the Babylonians, the Caucasians, the Scythians, Gog and Magog was founded upon self, a self-doctrine. The only reason a man invents, I said it this morning, the only reason he invents a moon god or a sun god is because he doesn't want to take his cross and die and abide by the laws of God's prophet, Shem. Shem was his prophet. I believe Shem held the office of Melchizedek. I did a Melchizedek series, four or five tapes. He held that office. They didn't want to do what Shem said, so they said, let us make us a Shem. Let us make us our own authority. So when man gets involved in moon worship, he doesn't bow to Jehovah God. He makes his, up, his own God up in his own mind, and he puts his own laws into that God. It doesn't matter if it's a Baptist or a Catholic or a Charismatic or a Buddhist, or a Hindu, if you deny this word, you've made your own name. Yeah. He says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. What are the high places? That's the mountains outside the cities in Israel where they would set up their tree goddesses, their moon goddesses. That's what we're wrestling with. That's the spiritual Gog. What we're wrestling with is self. We're wrestling with false doctrines. That's spiritual Gog and Magog. Now, literal Gog attacked Israel. Let's go back over here to the 38th chapter of Ezekiel. Let me finish reading this to you. But let's go to the 38th chapter of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is in the captivity in Babylon. Let me erase this and put something on the board. How much time do I have, Mike? I've got so much to tell you on this, and I ain't going to get through it. I'll come back next week and review some stuff and go back through this. I hope you can see this. Now, you have to understand Old Testament Gog, their essence, their beliefs, their moon worship, their self-worship, their let us make us a name worship. I can't get away from let us make us a name. Can you? That is the evil doctrine of the world, self. Yeah. 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 Let me read the rest of this. Caucasus meaning the moon, as though the term had reference to moon worshipers. May I recall to your mind Allah, the Lord moon, and the moon being the ruler of the darkness and high places of those who love to shine above others. God resists the proud, doesn't he? Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Men love darkness. What is it shines in the darkness? 
the moon shines in the darkness. The moon and God resist. Resist the proud. That word resist is the word A-N-T-I-T-A-S-S-O-M-A-I. That means to set oneself to war against the proud. Proud is the word H-U-P-E-R-E-P-H-A-N-O-S. It comes from hooper. Hooper meaning above. It's our word super. It means above. And the word phanos Meaning to shine. Where do you have to be to shine? In the dark. You can't take a candle in the light. When Christ is shining in our lives, we can't shine. When men try to get on stages or get awards or get bigger and better everything, when they do that, they're proud. They're shining in the darkness. They are moon worshipers is what they are. That's equivalent to spiritual Gog and Magog. Now, where was I? It, we can't study the 20th chapter of Revelation, and we can't study Gog and Magog unless we read this. God makes war against those who shine above others or spiritual Babylonians, the proud. God will make war with unrepentant nations spiritual Gog and Magog. Now let's go back to the 38th chapter of Ezekiel. Can you see this? All right. Ezekiel 38. 38. And, and say, verse 3, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, Satan, I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws. What's he talking about? In that day, back in the ancient world, when someone wanted to, uh, when a king rose up and he was a great and mighty king, and he was a great, great uh, warrior, and a great warrior was captured, the, the one thing you wanted to do was kill a great general. When Jael killed Sisera and she drove a nail through his head there in the book of Judges, she called him and invited him and said, would you like some milk? And <laughs> drove the nail through his skull while he was asleep. That was the greatest disgrace could happen to a man to be killed by a woman, especially if you're a great general. Whew. Insult on insult. They didn't want to be... They, Abimelech, the son of... Uh, Gideon said he got wounded when he was climbing up on a wall. A woman hit him in the head with a piece of volcanic stone. She hit him with a stone, with a millstone, and that's what those are made of. And he turned around and told one of his warriors, Kill me! I don't want it said when I die that a woman kill me! Men want that. Insulting. They had to kill the generals. What they did to them. They would make sure they could never lift a sword again. They would cut off their thumbs and their great toes, their big toes. When they did that, they had no balance. They couldn't run. They couldn't mount a horse. They couldn't do anything. And they could never pick up a weapon again. Look at that in Judges, the first chapter. Look at Judges, the first chapter. Judges. See, we have to study Gog and Magog and understand what spiritual Gog and Magog is. I think you're getting a picture of it already, aren't you? Huh? I hadn't looked at this in years, in a long time. All right, where's the great toes? It's here somewhere. Okay, required of me at, uh, let me see, spent in the edge of the sword. Hmm. It's in the first chapter, and I hadn't looked at it in so long. Huh? Oh, yeah, okay, that's it. And Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued after him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Three score and ten kings 
having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table, as I have done. So God hath requited me, and they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. What do you mean gather their food under the table? When they cut their thumbs and their great toes off, they would run hooks through their jaws, through here, through their mouth, and out the bottom of their jaw, just rip that open and run it through there, put them under the table, and throw them feed once, food once in a while like a pet dog. What does God say he's going to do to Gog in the 38th chapter? I will put hooks in thy jaws, and you'll be a dog to me under my table. And I will bring thee forth in all thine army, horses, horsemen, and all them that clothe with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Am I out of time? We're fixing to get into... <laughs> Boing! This is a cliffhanger. You know how they used to do that in the old movies? Boing! I got to stop. I'm just getting started on this. Yeah. Well, I've been trying to get to this for a long time. I want to stop here and come back. And we're going to see most writers believe that the 38th chapter of Ezekiel is about an attack on Israel at the end of time. I believe it's a picture of an attack on the church by spiritual Gog and Magog, according to that 20th chapter, when they go through all the earth to attack. Gog and Magog is going to attack the beloved city. The word beloved is agapa, agapao. Who is that? Us. Yeah, that's right. Let's stop. I'll come back next week, and we'll continue with Gog and Magog. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for truth. Thank you for, thank you for letting us see these things that are going to happen. God, help us in this ministry. Lord, I want to stay here with the people a long time to come. My health seems to fail from time to time. But, Lord, if you would be merciful, God... Give me strength and courage and, and health. Let me stand here till for many years, Lord, because there's so many things you've given me to say that I want to preach to these people. Help us to continue this work. And God will bow to your will in Christ's name. Amen.